This video is supported by The Great Courses Plus. Raphael Minicello boarded Transworld Airlines Flight 85 with a $15 ticket and a semi-automatic rifle. What's that thing in his bag? Looks like a fishing rod. LA just being a stop en route to San Francisco, most of the 40 passengers were already asleep. Five of them made up the pop band Harper's Bazaar, best known at the time for their cover of Simon and Garfunkel's Feeling Groovy. Yet they would become most famous for the events in 15 minutes' time. Once in the air, Raphael downed two shots of whiskey and made his way to the bathroom to assemble the rifle. The airport weighed his bag, but didn't search it. If so, they'd have found not only the rifle, but a knife and 250 rounds of ammunition. He pointed the gun at flight attendant Charlene Delmonico. Sir, you're not supposed to have that. Lead me to the cockpit. They walked the entire length of the plane, horrified passengers looking round. Is this really happening? A man stood up to help, but Raphael shouted, Halt! And he sat back down. This man is a soldier. When they reached the cockpit, she knocked, and the door opened. There's a man behind me with a gun. Raphael stepped inside. Turn towards New York. The jet age is now here. Before 1961, there had never been a hijacking in American airspace. Yet by the time Raphael boarded Flight 85, America was in the midst of a skyjacking epidemic. It was almost normal. There was nearly one a week. Pilots and crew had training, procedures, maps, and phrasebooks, ready to take hijackers to the one place they only ever asked to go, Havana, Cuba. Travel between the US and Cuba became almost impossible in 1961. This opened the floodgates to a new type of crime. In the next 10 years, hundreds of Americans hijacked planes to Cuba. Some sought a better life, some were escaping prison time, and some just wanted to please Fidel Castro by giving him an American plane. All were disillusioned and all were disappointed. Castro assumed most of them were spies or assassins. They were sent to work on tropical sugar farms where beatings and machete blows were regular punishment. The planes, however, did come in handy. Cuba charged airlines an average of $7,500 to return each plane, including passengers. In fact, if you count unwilling passengers stuck on grounded planes, over 5,000 Americans accidentally visited Cuba in the 1960s. American skyjackings became so common that there were serious plans to build a fake Havana airport in South Florida. With the exception of one drunk hijacker who tried to fly to Arkansas to rekindle the relationship with his ex-wife but managed to blind the captain before takeoff, Rafael Minicello was the first person to demand a hijacked plane be taken somewhere other than Cuba and his sights were set a lot further than New York. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a very nervous young man up here and we're going to take him wherever he wants to go. Where are we going? Cuba? Hong Kong? Cairo? This is bound to make the news. We gotta call our agent. But up in the cockpit, Captain Donald Kirk had some bad news. Look, Raphael, can I call you Raphael? We haven't got enough fuel to make it to New York. We're gonna have to stop. After some negotiation, he agreed to let Captain Cook land for refueling in Denver, Colorado. Whatever you're planning on doing, you only need Wenzel and me to fly the plane. There's a lot of scared people back there, and it ain't fair on them. Radio ahead. Tell them to turn off all the lights at the airport. I want no trouble. If everything goes well, I let the passengers and the crew leave. One of you stays though. I'll do it. I'll stay. 21-year-old Tracy Coleman had been with the airline five months. I'm not just going along for the ride. If one of us don't stay, he won't let the passengers off. Besides, my boyfriend is in New York. He'll be there. Trace, you're not going to New York. He can't stay there. He'll be arrested if he gets out. He's going somewhere else. I don't know where, but he's going somewhere else. The plane landed in thick fog and refueling went smoothly. Raphael let Charlene and the 39 passengers leave. The FBI were waiting to take statements from everyone, but Harper's Bazaar got to their agent first. Our plane's been hijacked! No, not Cuba, Denver! Calls were made and the airport filled with press. Every news outlet in America was now following the hijack. 
and all wanted Harper's Bazaar's inside story. It was the best publicity we ever had, by a mile. Before the FBI could make a move on the plane, they took off again. Raphael settled down in first class, pouring himself another whiskey as America woke up to the news of a hijacked plane heading towards New York. In 1969, a hijacked plane was still considered a form of transport, not yet a weapon. Airlines had a policy of total compliance. Hijackings weren't seen as a threat to national security. They were inconvenient, but only really financially. Taking the occasional detour via Cuba was much more cost-effective than having security at every airport. It wasn't until 1972, when three hijackers demanding $10 million threatened to fly a plane into a nuclear reactor, that calls for tighter security were taken seriously. Richard Nixon declared an emergency rule. Every airport would have to screen passengers with metal detectors, search bags, and have a police officer at every boarding gate. The airlines resisted, saying that it would be too expensive and passengers would stop flying. Who in their right mind would let airport staff search them? Would passengers really be willing to queue just to board a plane? But in January 1973, the new plans came into force anyway, and hijackings in American airspace plummeted. The previous four years had seen 108 hijackings, and the following four years, 11. Raphael's flight across the Midwest went peacefully. He informed the captain that they would only be refueling in New York, and he was to land as far away from the terminal as possible. They're asking on the radio, you've got to tell me where we're going. Rome. Italy? I can't fly that far. I don't have the training. Then get me someone who does. No hijacked plane had ever been taken to a different continent, and the FBI would do everything in their power to stop it. Nearly 100 agents were waiting as the plane landed in New York. The plan was to distract Raphael while they climbed on board disguised as mechanics. The following quotes are taken from a New York Times interview with Captain Cook two days from now. We had arranged that there would be a minimum ground crew when we landed at Kennedy. When we got there, there was the car with the replacement crew, but there were many other vehicles and many other men carrying weapons. This boy was no dope. He was a very intelligent young man. And when the FBI approached, he panicked. Get those people away from the plane! I stuck my head out and started screaming, We want everyone away from this plane! This boy is going to shoot us! There was a guy standing under the wing in a TWA outfit, but we could all tell he was FBI. I shouted, We've got to get out of here! Get us moving! And this clown, oh, I wish I could get my hands on him. He shouted back, We'll get moving when we're ready! When Raphael realized that fueling hadn't even begun, he exploded. He fired a shot into the ceiling. It was meant as a warning shot to the agents outside the plane. I was already convinced he meant business. First Officer Wenzel Williams tried to calm him down. Raphael was running up and down the aisle to make sure they weren't trying to sneak in the airplane. Later, the FBI admitted that two agents had managed to crawl up into the hold, but they had to back down when they heard the shot. The two replacement captains who could fly internationally pushed through onto the plane, but Raphael was convinced they were FBI. If they had been FBI agents and hadn't been able to start those engines, they would have signed their own death warrants. The ground crew were ordered back, and the plane took off immediately, with nowhere near enough fuel to reach Rome. We sat with that boy for six hours, and had seen him go from practically a raving maniac to a fairly complacent and intelligent young man. And then these idiots irresponsibly made up their own minds about how to handle this boy, and the good faith we had built up for almost six hours was completely destroyed. The FBI plan was damn near a prescription for getting the entire crew killed. We had nothing to do with that fiasco. Our only interest is keeping ourselves safe and our airplane in one piece. After that, he treated us real well. The new captains did the flying and we did public relations. Without enough fuel to cross the Atlantic, they made one more refueling stop in Bangor, Maine. After the events in New York, the FBI didn't dare try anything again. Raphael did spot two people close to a nearby building, but Captain Cook warned the tower. You'd better hurry. He says he's going to start shooting unless they get a move on. With a full tank, they took off again, becoming the first hijacked plane not heading towards Cuba to leave the United States airspace. 
Despite the high tensions, they had all now spent the better part of a day together. Some understanding and trust was beginning to develop. It was the first time I'd left the United States. I was nervous, but he was a very easy fellow to talk to. He taught me solitaire and spoke about his family moving over here, about how he wanted to see his dad again. Captain talked to him most. There was always a gun between us, but we both ignored it. We chatted back and forth like two guys in basic training. He asked about my home life and if I was married. I said we all were. Only one of us was, really, but I figured he was less likely to harm a married crew. I don't think he would have done it, though. He was a good kid, really. When I asked how he was doing, he told me everything about his family, Vietnam, and how he wound up on this plane pointing that gun at us all. In 1962, an earthquake struck the quiet town of Melito Epino in southwest Italy. Raphael's school, neighborhood, and home were destroyed. His family moved to America and settled in Seattle, Washington. He was proud of his adopted country and hoped one day to become an American citizen. So when the call for young men to fight came up, Raphael volunteered to join the Marine Corps. He was shipped off to Vietnam, aged 18. Friend and fellow platoon member Otis Turner spoke to the BBC about his and Raphael's time in Vietnam. Anybody will tell you we had the toughest job in the Marine Corps. We were in 120 degree weather in monsoon season. It was terrible. We were basically all about kill, kill, kill. That's all they wanted us to do. They drilled that into us from the very beginning. The leaders of my platoon just thought of me as cannon fodder. They'd set me first up the road with minesweeper so they can walk safe and not get blown up. There was no staging area to regroup or get your mind and body back working. There was no period there just to break it all down and think about what you just done to see a professional. There was a lot of sick people, confused people. Raphael was in a state. All of us were when we left Vietnam. Raphael's father had developed cancer and returned to Italy to die. While in Vietnam, he sent his earnings to a marine saving fund. He had saved $800, enough for a plane ticket to visit his father. But on return to his base in California, he found only $600 waiting in his account. All complaints and requests to receive the full amount were turned down. So seeking compensation, he drank eight cans of beer, broke into the camp store, and stole exactly $200 worth of items. He fell asleep inside and was caught the next morning. I just wanted to go home. I was going to be court-martialed. I didn't know what else to do. I got my rifle and cocked the bus to the airport. We've been set here all this time, Captain. Why haven't you taken it? Raphael, all of us have been in the service, and none of us want to fight in wars now, or kill anyone. I couldn't consider it unless it was a mandatory thing. Besides, we've gotten to like you, and we really think we can bring this to a conclusion without us being killed, and without you being killed. Well, I don't want to kill you. None of you. I'll kill myself before hurting any of you. I don't think you have to do this. And if you do have to, why don't you wait for us to get off the plane? There's going to be a shootout when we land isn't there. I'm not going to leave. Let's get you home first. We've come a long way. Only one more stop before Rome. As the plane began its approach to Ireland, it crossed another time zone. The new day was November 1st, Raphael's 20th birthday. Refueling took just half an hour, and they crossed Europe in the early hours. As the continent began to wake up, the plane finally entered Italian airspace. So what's the plan? We land as far from away as possible. Say that I want a car and the driver must be alone and unarmed. What do you want? I can demand money for you? Put you up in a nice hotel? <laughs> That's all right, bud. TWA fly to Rome all the time. We'll be at the Hilton. When they finally touched down in Rome, they had traveled 6,900 miles, breaking all distance records at the time to become the world's longest hijack. An Alfa Romeo drove up to the plane and a lone customs official got out. So long, Don. I'm sorry. I've given you guys an awful lot of trouble. That's all right. We don't take it personally. Wait, can I take your addresses? If I get out of these alive, I'll write. Raphael exited the plane, swapping his old hostages for a new one. They climbed into the car and sped off into the Italian countryside. Six miles outside of Rome, the car came to a dead end, and Raphael fled on foot. 
For five hours, he wandered the hills around Rome with hundreds of police officers, dogs and helicopters searching for him. He stashed the rifle in a barn, stole a change of clothes and joined a local congregation for morning mass. He stood out because he was wearing checkered Bermuda shorts and had seen his picture on the morning news. It took multiple phone calls from two different priests before the police took them seriously. When finally caught, he shouted the phrase that would make him famous across Italy. Countryman, why are you arresting me? The crew were thankful to hear that Raphael had been captured alive. We spent a lot of time with him and spoke like old friends. I just wish we met in other circumstances. Sir, sir, should he be punished? He's a boy who went to Vietnam at the age of 17. A boy that age isn't going to be stable enough for that sort of thing. This boy couldn't do it. He just blew his top. The boy ought to be helped. I don't think he was totally rational. What happened in New York? The Rome police put the FBI to shame. The FBI just wanted to engage in a shootout with a supposed criminal and bring him to justice. They would have wound up unnecessarily killing this boy, us, and probably destroyed a $7 million plane. The fact that all this was finally prevented proved out our point of view. It cost less in gunpowder and more in gasoline. Raphael became a folk hero and a symbol of the anti-Vietnam war sentiment in Italy. They refused to extradite him to the US where he could have faced the death penalty. As plane hijacking wasn't yet a crime in Italian law, he was only prosecuted for crimes in Italian airspace, kidnapping and possession of a weapon without a license. His lawyers framed his crime as a result of trauma from the war, emphasizing his bravery and earning him enormous sympathy from the Italian public. Raffaele Minichiello is here before you to demonstrate the strength of love for one's native land, his land, our land. Even from the moon, Minichiello would have come back to us to brief the air of Italy, to embrace his aged parents. His mother still lived in Seattle. He was found guilty, but served just 18 months in prison. Acting opportunities and a modeling career quickly fell through after his release. He settled down in Rome, worked as a bartender, and married the owner's daughter. He would be thrust back into the limelight one more time. In 1980, a 6.9 magnitude earthquake struck Italy, 20 miles from the one that destroyed Raphael's home 18 years before. He collected money from customers and friends, bought clothing and toiletries, and made the 300-mile trip multiple times to hand them out among the victims. I mistrust institutions, so I give help personally. I know all about earthquakes in Irpinia. That is where I was born, and that is where all my troubles began. When asked about the hijack, he said, I'm very different now to who I was. I'm sorry for what I did to those people. The US eventually dropped any outstanding criminal charges, and his old platoon members are still campaigning to have his dishonorable discharge from the Marines reversed. Until then, he is ineligible for PTSD treatment. With the help of his platoon, he wrote to all the passengers and crew they could track down, asking for their forgiveness. If they wanted to, he'd also be willing to meet, to give a proper apology and some kind of explanation. Charlene de Monaco and Wenzel Williams were the only ones to take up his offer. In a way, I got a little closure, saw a different viewpoint. I probably felt sorry for him. I thought he was very polite, but he was always polite. He left them a note. Thank you for your time so much. I appreciate your forgiveness for my actions. That put you in arm's way. God bless you. Raphael Minicello. The next time you're stuck on an involuntary 7,000-mile plane trip around the world, be prepared and have video lectures from The Great Courses Plus ready on your laptop, tablet, or phone. The Great Courses Plus is a fantastic online learning service with over 11,000 video lectures from world-leading professors. You can take courses in history, computing, biology, travel. You can learn to sing, draw, train a dog, or do Tai Chi, if you've got the legroom. While everyone else is twiddling their thumbs or worrying about the incredible danger they're in, you could be soaring through the sky, soaking up scholarly knowledge. Of course, none of us may ever fly in a real plane again, so if you need to scratch that travel itch, do what I did and take the Grey Courses Plus's virtual tour of Venice. 
I took a trip down the Grand Canal and had dinner in St. Mock Square, all while a professor of Italian history taught me about the local buildings, politics, art, food and drink. One Bellini, please. Now, the Great Courses Plus are giving viewers of human interest unlimited access to their library of courses by visiting thegreatcoursesplus.com slash human. Click the link in the description below to start your free trial today. They say travel broadens the mind, but a subscription to The Great Courses Plus fills it. Salute. I urge all of you to check out Roland Hughes's article for the BBC about this hijacking. It goes into a lot more detail and his research was invaluable to this video. There's a link to it along with all the other sources, references and footnotes in the pinned comment below. Thank you to everyone who helped me make this video and to all my Patreon supporters. Thank you for subscribing.